Please be seated. Friends, this past Friday and Saturday, Beth Carlson, Meredith Johnson, and I attended the Episcopal Church in Minnesota convention as your delegates to the convention. The convention includes um, members of all the churches, Episcopal churches in Minnesota, uh, laity, clergy, and the bishop. It was an incredible convention, one of the best that I have ever attended. The bishop, Craig Loya, has asked that the sermon that he gave at our opening communion be read or shared today at all of the Sunday services. I will do my best to speak for the bishop. I do not have his charisma or his great voice, but I will do my very, very best. To all God's beloved in Minnesota, grace to you and peace from God, the maker and from our Lord Jesus Christ. The bishop says, before I get into my actual address, I want to invite you to just take a moment to acknowledge the fact that this is the first time it, that our diocese has gathered together in convention since January 25th of 2020 in person. It has been a long and hard couple of years, and I hope that even though for many years forward, we're going to be processing the trauma and harvesting the wisdom and taking stock of how we have changed. And I hope one of the things that has changed personally is that we never take the gift of this for granted. The bishop began his talk with a reading from Genesis, the 11th chapter. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had a brick for stone and they had bitumen for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise we will be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. And the Lord said, look, they are one people and they all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. From our bishop. I don't know about you, but I've always found this story confusing and honestly, even a little troubling. I mean, the premise seems like a good thing, right? Human beings have rallied around a common cause and they have united across all their vast diversity and they've achieved something great together. But then God swoops in like an angry toddler and knocks the blocks over, scattering and confusing the builders as if to neutralize some perceived threat that God's, of God's supremacy. It seems petty and not at all in the character of the God that we imagine. What did the builders do wrong and what was the point of God's punishment? My understanding of this story totally shifted this summer when I read a brief commentary on it by Rabbi Ari Lam. Now, there are a number of curious things about this story. In the first place, while we are told at the beginning that the whole earth spoke the same language, the verses that immediately precede it 
tell us exactly the opposite. The descendants of Noah near the end of chapter 10 had been scattered across the earth, each speaking their own language. So which is it? It would seem that the plot has taken a sudden and unplanned turn in the space between two verses. Even more, that wording in Hebrew when they say, let us make bricks for ourselves, is the exact same phrasing that is used to describe the Israelites' experience of slavery in the land of Egypt, where they were forced to make bricks to build an empire of oppression. Those are the only two places in the Bible where the phrase for making bricks is used exactly that way. So that's on purpose. The editors of the book of Genesis want us to recall the story of slavery in Egypt when we hear the people say, let us make bricks. It's an awesome story. The layers go on and on. But the bottom line is that it turns out that this is fundamentally a story about how diversity is God's design and uniformity is human regression. It's Pharaoh who enforces a false uniformity by building. But God insists that creation run wild with diversity. And besides that, if you remember a few chapters back in Genesis, maybe you've heard that story that when God created human beings, God didn't appoint them to be builders, but gardeners, gardeners, putting us in Eden to till and to keep. See, we don't have to make a name for ourselves. We already have a name, which is beloved. Our sin at Babel is that we traded our vocation as gardeners for the seduction of becoming builders. God wasn't trying to stop us. God was trying to save us and to bring us back. Two weeks ago, October 11th, was exactly 20 years since the Friday evening when I was ordained, this is the bishop, to the transitional diaconate in tiny little Trinity Church in Mission, South Dakota. I only caught it like you often do with these things when I sat down to write my message for my weekly email newsletter and realized it was the feast of St. Philip the Deacon. It hit me like a punch in the gut, honestly. That's partly because milestones always remind us that the thread of life spools out with such breathtaking speed, and we are given to the people with whom we live and work and worship for such a preciously short time. But part of that was because as I th sat there reflecting on all those years, I was reminded again that the Episcopal Church has been having essentially the exact same conversation for the entirety of the two decades that I have served it as an ordained priest. We are anxious about our decline. We wring our hands about what we are going to do, or we bring in fancy speakers to give us some great new plan, or we distract ourselves with petty arguments, pointing our fingers at one another. How can we attract new members? What will we do with these treasured sacred buildings? We have spent so much time frantically trying to rebuild some imagined tower of church, and I have mostly gone along for the ride. I, many of you know this, I have even played a leadership role in some of the Episcopal Church's denomination-wide attempts to do this. They have all failed. And as I sat staring at a blank screen that afternoon, I was embarrassed by the anxious ways that I have spent too much of the precious little time that I have. Frankly, if there was a solution, we would have found it by now. The truth is the tower we think we used to be 
has been almost completely toppled by cultural and economic and historical forces that none of us caused and none of us can stop. But we are exhausted from trying. We have worn ourselves out believing that lie that we can make a name for ourselves again if we can just make enough bricks. My heart's deepest hope is that as, this, as a diocese, this convention mark a turning point. Not because we discover some grand new plan for rebuilding our beloved tower, but because this is where we decide to set aside our ambition to be builders and take up our calling to be gardeners. From the perspective that I have as your bishop, I see three options for us. We can keep doing most of the same things in most of the same ways we've done for so long, and that might be, not be an entirely bad option. Along the way, we can entertain ourselves with petty fights that we make up or by passing the hot potato of blame around between the clergy, the lay leadership, the bishop, the diocesan staff, or whoever else we can find to catch it and play the game for a while. That's a choice. We can stay here. We can just play out the thread and have a little dysfunctional fun along the way. We could also, and this is probably a less likely option, we could also just retreat and give up. We could walk away and fly the white flag and give up. But I don't think that's going to happen, but who would blame us if it did? But what I want to wonder about today is, I wonder if, instead of white-knuckled graspings or indignant surrender, we could just stay here, but let go. Not give up, but let go of those heavy bricks in our hands and just play in the dirt together for a while, waiting to see what God might grow when we aren't keeping God at arm's length with all our building. Minnesota, can this be a point where we stop, at least for a season, worrying about how to build and return to the practice of gardening God's church for God's world? So what if we do? Just pretend that we say yes to that question for a minute. What might it look like for us to try to do that? There are three things I want us to invite us to consider together about what it might look like for us to return to our vocation as gardeners. First, what if we spend time not doing much else but tending to our root system? Nothing can grow tall or wide or bear any fruit at all until it has first grown deep. Two years ago, we identified four diocesan priorities, discipleship, justice, faithful innovation, and congregational vitality. Discipleship is without question the keystone priority. That's the only way that God will use us to grow the deep and thick root system that can produce the fruits of justice, innovation, and vitality. What I want to invite us all into today is to spend at least the next year focusing almost exclusively on discipleship, that is, participating fully in God's life by intentionally apprenticing ourselves movement by move, movement and moment by moment to Jesus. Focusing on those simple practices of daily prayer, dwelling in scripture, sharing our lives in real ways with each other, and coming alongside the poor and the marginalized. I'm asking you to commit to yourself and so invite everyone in your faith community to be part of a small discipleship group in the next year that is committed to doing so with other people. There's a new resource some of you have seen from the Episcopal Church that's called Centered, which is really nothing more 
than a simple way for us to gather in small discipleship groups to support and share with one another as we tend to our root system. I hope, and I really mean this, I hope that every Minnesota Episcopalian will become part of one of those small gatherings this year. You don't have to use centered, but it is simple, it's easy to use, and all its people need is to join up with three or four or five other people. What can we gather, can we gather ourselves into small communities to deepen our roots together? What if we relearn together how to consciously and intentionally let God lead in our lives and in our ministries? You've often heard me say this before, that I am not the only one who says it, and I didn't make it up, but in the Episcopal Church, as much as I love us, we often operate as if we are functional atheists. We are so good at talking about God as if God is a wonderful and interesting and great idea, but it is less often that we talk about God as if we expect God to show up and do something in our lives and in our ministries. Gardeners can't force anything to grow. Gardeners can only cultivate the conditions that allow life to flourish. It's nature and God doing their things that gives that growth. I will stand here at my first in-person convention and admit to you without shame or fear that I do not know how to save or fix this church, and you don't either. But the good news is that saving and fixing the church turns out it's not my job and it's not your job. The church is God's job. Our job is to stand out in the fields and let God use us in whatever way God will cultivate the fruits of love, of hope, of reconciliation, of forgiveness, of peace and joy. We can bring whatever tools we can afford along with us, and we can do our best to care for those tools together. But whether, how, and where the fruit sprouts and ripens is not anything you or I can control, so we may as well relieve ourselves of the burden of trying to make or repair so many more bricks. If God is who we and the scriptures claim God is, I mean, just go with that for a minute. If God is who we really claim God to be, then honestly, God is going to be about the project of healing the world with love, whether the Episcopal Church is on board or not, and no matter how small, large, wealthy, or poor we might happen to be along the way. So can we lay down the burden of thinking that it's our job to force fruit to grow and learn to simply recognize and follow where God is already leading? Can we help God cultivate a diverse church ecology? This is why I started with that story in Genesis. Diversity is God's design. The drive for uniformity is part of how we distort the ways that we are made in God's image. That's just not true for language, nation, race, tribe, and culture, though it's certainly true for all of that. But it's also true for the way the church expresses and organizes itself. It's strange that for the past hundred or so years, give or take a few hundred years, we have essentially had one mental picture of what it means to be a local community of disciples. You can all recite it. You have a building, you have a priest, people come to the building for an hour on Sunday for Eucharist, you offer programs and services that people either want or they don't. And while there is a lot about that model without question that is important and life-giving, and it's not totally going anywhere anytime soon, it tends to focus more on the question 
of how do we get people to show up for our stuff rather than on how we are helping people to show up looking and acting like Jesus in the world. And the other thing I'm scratching my head about is that we somehow along the way adopted the mindset that bigger is better. But small communities are where we can really share ourselves together. Small communities are where we can help each other and others become apprentices of Jesus more fully. That drive for every church to follow the same model and for churches to be big is Pharaoh pushing us to make bricks and build Babel. Our bishop had somewhat of a long sermon. I'm just going to pause for a moment, just pause for a moment to let you think about what the bishop has said. And I'll go on. The bishop. I'm going to say something crazy now. We often assume, I think, that our future as a diocese will involve fewer congregations. We imagine that we'll have fewer congregations than we do today. And when we think that, we assume that our work right now is just to turn it and just to downsize appropriately. But what if that's not true? What if our future looks more like faith communities that we have now, but they are mostly smaller? What if God is urging us in this season to form gatherings of five to 10 people who meet in living rooms or the beauty of the outdoors who, who pray? This will shock you even while they are fishing or backpacking together or after Sunday morning soccer games or whatever. What if we form small groups who till justice by listening and feeding their neighbors? Or some of those small groups joined up with one or more of our larger traditional communities once a month for a Eucharist and story slam about all the things they're seeing God doing in their lives and in the world? What if we followed hundreds of seedling crazy ideas for how we can connect the gospel of love with a world starving for it that evidently isn't finding it in a lot of our traditional spaces? What if we just followed that and held it lightly and see what God grows? In the coming months, Canon Blair Pogue is going to begin gathering some groups to try to do just that. She's going to begin gathering a group of us to begin playing with what might what that might look like. How might we gently help God shift to the landscape and the center of gravity in the diocese to what is small and joining God in the world? Now, I don't know if any of that will work at all, and I don't know what will happen, but we can totally do it. It's a real option for us on our buffet of options for this moment. This is my invitation. Tending our root system as disciples so that we can let God lead us, and I mean really lead us, and then join God in cultivating a widely diverse ecology. We can't control what will happen, but we can till the soil. We can water it, weed it, and see what God might do. I believe that God is not done with this church, and I know my own sinfulness well enough to know that there's no way that God is done with me. And if a wild revival of the small, like I'm describing, seems hard to believe, then you are welcome to join me the next time I visit Emmanuel Church in Alexandria and see the way that they have gardened a food shelf for 40 years that now feeds a whole Minnesota county. And after we tour the food shelf, you can join us for four generations who joyfully pose for a picture with Big Oli. And you are welcome to stand next to me in front of the bulletin board at Holy Trinity in International Falls and see all the photos and news clippings of the way 
that they rally their entire town to fill every crack that they can see with God's abundant love. And you can come sit with me on Friday evening in Chatfield and listen to that group talk about how they are listening deeply to their neighbors, literally going around and knocking on doors to get to know the stories of what God is doing around their church building. And after the convention, just for fun, we can drive along the Root River over to Rushford. And if you have any doubts about God's goodness or power, I promise you that seeing the Driftless in October will knock all of those out entirely. And if you don't want to hang out with me, that's fine. You can follow Padre Neptale of a weekend as he surfs from Quinicera to Quinicera to a Saturday night and then Saturday morning liturgy for three generations of immigrant families who know that God is real and alive and good. You can join the folks at Holy Trinity in St. Paul for a Sunday morning that every time feels like being wrapped in a warm blanket of love on a cold Minnesota day. And if you don't want to go that far, you can walk down the street and sit in the courtyard at Calvary Church and look across the street as the fullest imaginable spectrum of human beings walk in and out of the Mayo Clinic all day long, all of them seeking healing like the crowds pushing in to just touch Jesus. And if you want to talk about the privilege that bishops have, that is it. I get to see all of that all the time, every single day. I want so badly to see it too, to come up, for you to come up in that plane with me and look over this beautiful diocese at 30,000 feet, or at least to ride along next to me in the diocesan Volkswagen. This is a moment for us to decide, Minnesota. Are we going to keep trying to be builders or can we take up gardening again? I can't answer for you, but I'm going to do my best to say yes to God's invitation to set down the brick building and relearn how to garden. I really hope you will join me and say yes to this invitation too. The world can be such a lonely desert, parched and suffering in justice and sorrow. And the God that I know and meet in all of you every day longs to reforest the world, not with more towers that impress, but with fruit that nourishes, with love and justice and joy. We don't know what will happen. We don't know what the future might hold. But let's use what tiny little time we have to dig into God's soil, to help the whole world see and know what unimaginably good things God and God alone can bring forth. Submitted to you on this 28th day of October in the city of Rochester, the Center for the World's Healing, I am your deeply grateful companion on the way, the Right Reverend Craig W. Loya, 10th Bishop of Minnesota. <laughs>